much bigger than that. Oh. oh. So they they be like twice as big as your big board at least. So it'd be much easier for people to see. Yeah, because I agree with you so much. You can blow this up this much and it's a quarter. You can blow another step is twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. up there next. Um, so. Anyone that wants to know, we had some wonderful photographs of that episode, which uh, I think I still got hit in all those short sighted times. But we've worked sites together and we've had a good time. But the, a lot of the things you see up here are Shirley's that came off her farm. And the reason we asked her to make the presentation tonight about the French uh, trappers and the early settlers was because the French fort that was on the Kankakee is on her farm. And she'd done a lot of work on it, and I felt, well, knowing Shirley's ability to work in archaeology, she'll do a good job of making this presentation, because she's already got a lot of the research. And so I asked her, and then we kind of prodded her a little bit, and Shirley finally agreed that she would do it. We would work with her schedule, which we did. So I think you're going to really enjoy the lecture tonight. Shirley's done a lot of work on the history of this, and I think you, you'll fit right in. <laughs> Thank you. I have to stir that with my drink. The reason that I'm out of sequence is because I told them no three times. <laughs> and they never listen to me, do they? And I really wanted to do the archaeology part, the prehistory, but you know how Bob and uh, what's his name is? They. <laughs> They take over everything. So uh, we're going to start tonight and talk a little bit on about 300 years of history. <laughs> we're going to talk about the French, the French government, the priest, the voyagers, and the trappers. And I had to get my two cents in, some Indians too. Okay. So in May 19, or 1663, Canada was made a royal province and the governing of all French pro uh, possessions in North America entrusted to a lieutenant general who was to reside in Quebec. On June 30th, 1665, the first of these officials arrived, Lieutenant General Alexander de Proville, Marquis de Tracy. That was one man with that name. A full regiment of infantry, the regiment of Selliers, which included a thousand men came with him as reinforcements against the Iroquois attacks. On September 12th, both the governor, Daniel de Ramey de Corcellus, and the new intendant, Jean Talon, arrived together after a very stormy crossing. The position of the intendant was new in the hierarchy of the French royal administration, having been created by Louis XIII. 
and the role of the intendant was to assist the governors of the provinces in the discharge of their duties. And through this innovation, the crown was able to exert control over local governments. At the time of the arrival of these new French officers, New France was in danger of disappearing altogether, partly because of decades of royal neglect, but also from the continual threat presented by the only American Indian people allied to the, the, to the British, the Iroquois, and they were ferocious. The most effective administrator am among the three would prove to be Intendant Jean Talon. He was born in 1625 to a family belonging to the <laughs> Noblesse de Robe. He had received the usual solid education that the Jesuits provided <coughs> to the children of the upper and middle class. Talon later entered military administration, where his eye for detail, his talent for organization, his love for work, and above all, his deep sense of loyalty quickly attracted the minister's attention. And two years later, he was appointed intendant to a vital province guarding the northern border of, of France. So when an intendant was sought for, the frontiers of French, for the frontiers of French North America, he was immediately sent for. Talon remained intendant of New France for seven years. So I'd like to show you a little bit of this graph of what we have here. Can you hear me when I walk around? Is yeah. I'm still tuned in, okay. So what we have here is the military government. We have the church and the commerce, the three working together, okay? And so the church the government provided subsidies and provisions for the church. In return, the church pacified the Indians and provided military information. Like they were spied a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then the church, pacifying the Indians, created markets for goods, for commerce, okay? Commerce, in turn, gave trade goods, maintained pacifying the Indians. Okay, the military government, again, was starting commerce. Tr troops provided pro market and protection. And the voyageurs reinforced troops in battle. Merchants provided provisions and service. Okay, so we have three different sources here that uh, the interdependent influence of the New World to be. Okay, now I would like to walk a little bit through this history here. I marked it up there. Some of you can see those dates, and then some of you students that would like to come and copy it, I think uh, you can come up here at intermission and copy. Uh, so we're going to walk you through a couple hundred years here. That, and it kind of shows, you know, the parallels of we had two major societies coming over to this paradise to take over. We had the English colonies coming from the east, and then we have New France coming in from Canada and coming down from there. So in 1605, we had. Um, Port Royal, which is Acadia. 1607 was Jamestown was founded by the English. 1608, Champlain founded Quebec. And 1620, Plymouth Colonies was founded. That's a long time ago, isn't it? 1629, Massachusetts Bay, Massachusetts Bay Colony was chartered. And 36, Roger Williams founded Rhode Island. And in 1638, we had the Colony of Connecticut founded. And Jean uh, Nicolette explores Lake Superior. In 1642, Montreal was founded. In 1944, the British seized New Amsterdam, which would be New York and Albany. In 1670, the Carolina colony was established. And in 1671, Father Marquette establishes a mission at Michishillimackinac. Joliet and Marquette explores the Mississippi in 73. And LaSalle establishes Illinois Post, discovering the mouth of the Mississippi and claiming Louisiana for France. <coughs> 1691, the Royal Colony of Massachusetts was organized and post, and this would be by the English, and then in the French, the posts were established at Peoria, Chicago, and the St. Joseph's River at Niles, Michigan. In 1699, Iberville and Benville founded Biloxi, Mississippi. Seven, so they really got down there, didn't they? 1701, Cadillac founded Detroit. 1714, Nova Scotia. 1718, Benville founded New Orleans. We jump down here. 1749, Halifax was started by the English, Nova Scotia. 
And then in 1749, the Ohio Company claims the Ohio Valley. So we're starting to get into our area here. And New France claims the Ohio Valley. So you can see where these conflicts are starting to come in. 1754, Major Washington attacks the French, and then Valiers defeats Washington. I mean, he really got his derriere whipped. In 1755, Braddock marches on Fort Duquesne. Bourgeau and Dumas defeats Braddock, and he's still buried up there by the Canadian border. 1759, Quebec Falls, and 1760, Montreal Falls. Then in 63, 1763, and I have copies of this for you students if you'd like to copy, then you won't have to keep up with me, okay? 1763, we have the Pontiac Revolt. 78, France recognizes the United States. And in 1783, the tra Treaty of Paris ends American Revolution. It took about seven years of conflict to get that going. Okay, are you with me so far? I'm get, just setting up the background, so I hope this part isn't boring, but it's real important, and I think it's of an interest of how it all started. I mean, you know, you learned this in school, but who cared then, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if we went into that much detail, so. So d why did they come here? Land acquisition for the church and for New France, and for riches from the fur trade. How did they get here, and where did they settle? Well, their only mode of transportation was the lakes and the rivers, and that's why northern Indiana was one of the first to be discovered because we were right there on the tip of Lake Michigan. Another important element in the pursuit of French expansion in North America during the late 1600s was the possible existence of a large waterway to be believed to be somewhere to the west of the Great Lakes. The French had been looking for this river for 40 years. They hoped that it would prove to be more than an Indian myth and moreover that it would flow into a westerly direction towards China, providing direct passage to the coveted wealth of Asia. In 1665, after the French had temporarily destroyed the hostile grip of the Iroquois on the western shores of the St. Lawrence River, uh, with the new renewed strength brought by the regiment of military, dozens of young men from Montreal and Canada, the voyageurs, sought, sought their fortunes by traveling west with the flotillas and Indian traders. They were attempting to enter the fur trade and become wealthy. We now, and I would like to show you a little bit about that route here where they came in. Right down through here. Now you see, people ask, you know, what Indians was here and what time period? Well, it depends on where the Iroquois were and how, how mad they were. Because when the Iroquois came, look how far they came. They came clear over into Illinois and they were so ferocious that the rest of those Indians, they jumped the Mississippi. That's how bad they were. So there's different time frames that they came through there. So now we're going to talk about La Salle the Man. He was one of the most important voyagers that came through northwest Indiana in this area. Born in Rowan, Normandy in 1643 into a wealthy merchant's family, La Salle had entered the Jesuit seminary in 1658. In 1660, he took minor religious vows and entered the Royal College of La Fetche, where he took classes in math and physics and later taught. Unhappy over religious discipline, he asked permission to leave the order, which was granted on January 28, 1667. La Salle was 23 years old when he arrived in Canada, where his older brother was a supplicant monk. His fir he first tried farming a little piece of land outside of Montreal. Three years later, La Salle, unsuccessful at farming, and with adventure on his mind of finding the Northwest Passage, left on his first exploration in the company of two supplicant missionaries. He's kind of a little bit like the youth of today, right? He went to college, had three different jobs, didn't like any of them, and he had to go out and find himself. <laughs> Came clear across the ocean to do that, right? How many kids would send your your, your sons across the ocean in their early 20s, right, by themselves. And that's what these priests and missionaries were doing when they come over here. In 1673, the Sal made his first trip down the western side of Lake Michigan, and you can kind of follow that on the map up there, into Illinois. And he kind of looked it over, and at this time, decisions were being made to start a chain of trading posts from Quebec, Canada, to New Orleans. And we were part of that chain of, of missions and trading posts at that time. Uh, here's his journey to the Gulf, if you can see here. 
first he uh, look how he comes he comes around these lakes from Quebec up here through the lakes like this and he comes down the tip of Lake Michigan and there's Fort Miami which is Fort St. Joseph okay now Marquette and Joliet when they discovered the Mississippi they didn't get all the way down in 1673 they got about to here Okay, but LaSalle goes all the way down in 1682, clear to the mouth, and he claims the whole area for France. For France. You can come up and take a look at that at break time if you like. So in April 1682, LaSalle claims the Mississippi to the Gulf for New France. Tonti was a Jesuit, and he was with LaSalle, and he wrote a lot in the copies of the Jesuit Relations and Allied Documents. Has anyone ever read those? There are wonderful records of the Jesuit priests that travels with all these voyagers. And I'm sure St. Joe has got a copy. It's a 49-volume set. And you can check them out and read them. They're, they're really interesting. It takes a long time, but... Anyway, Tanti writes, and here's one of his quotes, Our canoe failed us and leaked on all sides. After some days traveling, we had to leave it in the woods and make the rest of our journey by land, walking barefoot over snow and ice. I made shoes for my companions and myself with Father Gabriel's cloak. As we had no compass, we frequently got lost and found ourselves in the evening where we had started in the morning without any other food than acorns and little roots. The Sieur de Bois, Bonnet had a pewter cup that he melted to make balls for his gun, which had no flint. By firing it with a coal, he killed some turkeys. So I can't figure this out, but it must have been a flint lock rifle, right? And he had no flint? Is that what he's trying to say? And he used a piece of coal to fire it with. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> Primitive. And it's hard to catch a wild turkey, isn't it? Um. I mean, the hunters today with all the big rifles, it's still hard to catch a wild turkey, right? Do you hunt wild turkeys? You are a turkey? <laughs> Tanti and his men were separated from LaSalle's group. They found each other in the morning as LaSalle and his group were returning from Fort St. Joseph. Okay. LaSalle sailed for Canada at the age of 23 and was to spend 20 years in preparing for and exploring the New World. At the age of 43, he was assassinated by his own men at a site on the Trinity River in the present state of Texas. Lassell died in debt, having borrowed money for his last expedition from the Seminary of Montreal and from Sieur, Sieur Penn of Paris. These debts he had planned to pay back with beaver pelts. So neither one of them got paid back, did they? In 17, uh, 1976, do you remember the reenactment of Lassell's trip through here? Did anyone go to see that? Uh, they left Montreal August the 11th, 1976, and it was a very hard winter. They froze up on the lakes and the rivers. I know they stopped over at Bombs Bridge, and people took food in because they were, I mean, it was 20 below, and they, you know, they couldn't, the, the river was so frozen that they couldn't get any farther by canoe. And so they carried their canoes, and when they were portaging by Hebron, they were hit, four of them was hit by cars, and they were hospitalized. But they did finish their trip, and they took the injured people by buses down there so they all landed together in New Orleans April the 9th. So that was the reenactment of LaSalle's trip for our bicentennial. Okay, so now we're going to go into a little bit about the forts and you know where we said why did they come here and now we're going to find where they settled. Okay, uh, two years ago I started to make the trip down on the Ohio River and visit all the forts in Illinois. Okay, the day before I was ready to leave, they were closing roads because of the floods. <laughs> so this last year, we did plan and take the trip. And we got all the way through Illinois, and there was only one that had damage that was still remaining. But we're gonna start with Fort Miami, <coughs> up by Niles, Michigan. That's wonderful territory to go still look at today. Fort Miami, it's very confusing because there are four Fort Miamis. One in Missouri, one at Fort Wayne, Indiana, one on the Maumee River near Toledo, Ohio, another one on the Illinois, and there are three Miami Rivers. Okay, so it's a little confusing when you're doing some research. Fort Miami has this a marker there. It says, here in November 1679 on the Miami River, as the St. Joseph was then called, <laughs> LaSalle, the French explorer, built a fort as a base for his western exploration. Here he awaited the griffin, 
the upper lake's first ship. When the ill-fated vessel did not come, he made his way on foot to Canada through Lower Michigan, Lower Michigan's uncharted wilderness. Now remember last Sunday how cold it was? <laughs> I didn't even want to go outside. And if you can imagine these men walking around or on these waters, and if you see the signs of some of those little canoes, if you go to a museum and see those, you can imagine coming down Lake Michigan and down the rivers, but what do they do going back up? I mean, you know, it was cold and ice, and I guess they had a lot of stamina. Uh, let's see where we at here. When the ill-fated vessel did not come, he made his way back through the wilderness. He returned in 1681 to prepare his great push down the Mississippi. A decade later, the French built Fort St. Joseph, some 20 miles upriver near Niles, Michigan. And this is one of the most important forts because it controlled the lakes and the rivers, the headwaters of all of this area. In 1762, Thomas Hutchins, an engineer with the British Army, inspected the fort and stated it was inhabited by about a dozen French families. Fort Tassinong, which is my fort on my farm, was started in 1673. It was a French mission, a trading post, and a Potawatomi village, and we'll get into it later on down the, down the track here. Wanata and English Lakes had very active trading posts during this time period. Okay. Oh, I have one map I didn't put up. Phil, that'll be a good job for you. <laughs> you get some pants. We can do it at break time. But at break time, uh, this is an old map that has all the Indian trails on it and a lot of the forts and so forth. And so we'll pin it up here so everybody can come and see it. Okay? Because uh, there's the Seacoast sites are on there, and one's at Kokomo and one's at Attica. And I've been to, to the one site down there, and I'd like to show them to you on the map. Fort Wiatnon was in 1717. See, they're not as quite as old as we were, 1673 to 1717. It was a French post at Wiatnon founded at request of the Indians in the area to secure the area for French trading purposes and political reason. And back again, we're going to government, military, and church, okay? In 1746, the fort described as a little establishment made up of only about 20 inhabitants. In 1754 to 58, Fort Wiatnon was described as a fort of upright poles. Not much history was written that year. <laughs> In 1761, the British take command of Fort Wiatnon towards the end of the Seven Year War. 1763, Pontiac's Rebellion, Fort Wiatnon is temporarily seized by the Way, the Kickapoo, and Muscotin. Does everybody know where Fort Wiatnon is? Lafayette, right. Okay, it is on the wrong site. You do realize that. In 1770, Fort described as a stockade with about 12 families living inside and about 1,000 warriors on the outside. So there was always reason for a fort, right? You never know who was on the inside and who was on the outside. 1778, the fort was described as a double range of houses enclosed with a stockade, stockade 10 feet high. 1783, the area was ceded to the United States. 1791, Indian village and areas burned by General Scott and his militia. And so now we go down to Fort Ascension, Massiac in Illinois, and this is one I visited last year, and I'd recommend it to anyone. There's a lot of history, a lot of art artifacts here. Fort Ma Massiac was the last French fort built in North America. Its defenses were tested only once after it was built. The Cherokee warriors attacked the fort, but were driven off. The French fortunes continue, continually worsened, and Fort Massiac became, became a haven for French soldiers fleeing downstream from advancing, advancing British troops. The final blow for French power in the New World came in 1763, when the Treaty of Paris officially ended the French and Indian War was signed in France. King Louis' great North America empire was no more. <coughs> The French land west of the Mississippi had been ceded to Spain by secret treaty of 1762, and now lands east of the Mississippi went to the British. The peace treaty did not, ever, however, mean the immediate end of the French military presence in the Illinois country. Followers of the Indian chieftain Pontiac remained loyal to the French, the British troops out of the area for more or two, 
two or more years. For about a year following the signing of the Treaty of Paris, a skeleton force of one officer and 15 enlisted men remained at Fort Massac. It goes from Massiac, which was French, then it goes to British Massac. In 1765, a command, company of the 42nd Highlanders, commanded by Captain Thomas Sterling, arrived by river at the burnout fort. Sterling noted the fort in his, his diary and his company continued on to Fort Duchardt's to accept its official surrender. Almost 13 years passed before more military visitors arrived at the ruined fort. In late June of 78, George Rogers Clark and 150 soldiers from Virginia and Kentucky landed just upstream for, from Fort Massac. Under orders from Patrick Henry, governor of Virginia, they were attempting to capture the few British claimed settlements for the Illinois country. Rumors still persisted that the fort was still garrisoned, but after finding it empty, Clark and his soldiers spent the night here and then began a six-day, 100-mile march over land to the Mississippi to capture Kaskaskia. Clark's men then continued their march north, taking Prairie du Chien, St. Philip, Cahokia, and later slogging north through flooded Illinois bottomlands, took Fort Sackville at Vincennes, Indiana. With the exception of taking Fort Sackville, Clark and his men encountered no armed resistance. And I think they took Fort Sackville without a shot being fired too, if I remember history right. Some of you school teachers know? <laughs> Fort Kaskaskia. And we got to see that too, even after the floods ravaged through it. So it was started in 1703. It was located on an island between the Illinois and the Kaskaskia River. And they had a, had a Liberty Bell out there too, and a lot of graves. About a hundred years ago, they had a flood that was worse than the flood of two years ago. So at that time, they moved the cemetery up onto the hilltops around there. There are quite a high bluffs around there. The cemetery was moved from the original site up on the surrounding hilltops. There was at least 1,500 plus graves up there. And when you walk it on a day when it's 100 degrees and you get down in the valleys and go back up the hill, you know you've walked it, okay? But it's well worth it. And the cemetery is located behind Pierre Menard's home. The Pierre Menard home. By the early 1790s, Menard had established a solid trading business of his own. His Kaskaskia ledger began the spring of 1791, and he was granted a St. Clair County commercial license in 1763. At the age of 30, Menard was already a respected and successful entrepreneur. The Pierre, Pierre Menard home, the finest example of southern French colonial architecture in the central part of the Mississippi Valley. It was built in 1800 and still has most of its original furnishings, and it's well worth going through to see. A fort de Chartres, now all these uh, forts that we saw, of course, were on the Ohio River in Illinois, but the last one is on the Mississippi in Illinois, and so there was destruction in the back of that, and so they had it roped off, and they would not let us come in to take pictures. Um, Fort de Chartres, the original stone fort was begun in 1753 and was replacing the wooden forts of which were built in 1718 and 1720. It's worth going back to see. Okay, French colonial Cahokia. In 1699, Missionaries from the Seminary of Foreign Missions in Quebec settled among a village of nearly 90 cabins of the Tamarara and Cahokia Illini Indians. A chapel was built and the raising of the cross was celebrated during the third week of May. An estimated 2,000 Indians attended the ceremony, including Cahokia, Tamarara, Michigami, and Peoria. This settlement, which became known as Cahokia, was the first of several French forts and villages in the American bottomland region of the Illinois country. The other French settlements located on the eastern side of the Mississippi River included Kaskaskia, 1703, Fort Deschartes, 1719, Prairie du Roker, 1721, St. Philippi, 1723. Across the Mississippi River in Missouri were the historic French settlements of St. Genevieve, 1750, and St. Louis, 1764. Now, colonial Cahokia is not to be mistaken with the mound builder Cahokia, which is 10 miles to the north. 10 miles to the north, the Indians of the late woodland cultures inhabited the area for 150 to 200 years, beginning about 700 AD. 
A second more sophisticated culture, the Mississippian culture, emerged between 850 and 900 AD. It vanished sometime after 1300 AD. At its peak, Cahokia, approximately 20,000 residents. It has Monk's Mound on it. You've probably seen pictures at it or seen it on TV. The largest prehistoric earthen construction in the New World. It is 100 feet tall. The four-tiered platform was built in stages over a period of 300 years. Its base covers more than 14 acres, and it contains about 22 million cubic feet of earth. Okay, has anyone seen it? Did not see it? It's not that far away. I mean, just get your canoe on the river and go. It's right downstream. But they just have a new museum down there, and it's just wonderful. I mean, you could spend two days there. So, okay, now we're going to talk about. Let's bring us up to date on some of these maps here. Okay. Where's my yardstick? <laughs> right there it is. I'm so glad Phil's in there. Okay. I want to show you this map first because when the French made the map, if you see this one, then when you see the ones I made, you won't laugh at them. Okay. <laughs> but this is one of the early French maps. I think it dates about 1697. They kind of squashed up Lake Michigan, right? And they've got some of the rivers in the wrong places. And here's a map over here. I'd like you to come up and look at it, break. This show is a map of 1830 of the Indian villages in Michigan Territory, Indiana and Ohio. And it still has Tassinong, Fort Tassinong on there. It's still listed on here. Again, here's the map of what we've been routing with all. It has all this, the forts on there that you can come and see. Okay, and now this map, you know, when I started doing research on this, I thought, we have so many historic sites in Porter County. But you, I, to my knowledge, there aren't many in Jasper County, right? That's true. You didn't live on the interstates. That was the problem, you know. You weren't on that Lake Michigan and uh, Mississippi, Indiana River, Illinois River. But here I'll show you a little bit of why we were so important. Here's Lake Michigan, my map, Fort St. Joseph, and this is the Kankakee River. And this is an insert of this area. And this is probably 12 to 18 miles wide. You know, it's impassable swamp. But Tassinong, if you'll see, this is the road from the Sock Trail that came down at the narrowest part right here. This is Bombsbridge Road. This is the narrowest part of where you could get across the river. Sandy Hook and Crooked Creek were two streams that came up out or came down into the river here. At one time, Sandy Hook was two miles wide when it entered the river. So we were about eight miles north of the river, which was the first high drying ground in between these two uh, canoe routes of river routes, okay? Now we're going to go into a little bit about Indian chiefs and some of our traders. How's our time doing? It's just about time to write. Okay. The first one is going to be Winnemac. There has been much misunderstanding about Chief Winnemac because there were two Potawatomi chiefs by the same name. One was friendly to the United States. The other was bitterly opposed to the Americans. The latter was killed in 1812 in a fight with the friendly Shawnee chief, Captain Logan. The subject of this sketch died in 1821. His village was on the Wabash River, 11 miles downstream from the mouth of the Eel River where Logan's Fort now stands. While General Harrison was governor of Indiana Territory, Winnemac was his friend, friendly aid in getting the Indians to make adjustments of the land. Harrison wrote that Winnemac was an open and avid friend to, of the United States. He was strongly opposed to Tecumseh. For this reason, he was marked for death by the Shawnee. And I've read about Harrison, and I read about Tecumseh, and I'm on Tecumseh's side. <laughs> At one time in council, Tecumseh poured out a torrent of abuse upon Winnemac and threatened his life. Winnemac coolly got his pistol ready and was undisturbed by the threats of the great Shawnee chief. Tecumseh accused Winnemac of trying to persuade the Indians to sell their land to the United States. Winnemac reported all the plans of Tecumseh to General Harrison. 
At one time, he attended a great council held at the Cow Pass, Pass now known as Bert Bertrand, Michigan. There, the council, under T Tecumseh's suggestion, planned to kill all the old chiefs and enlist the younger ones against Harrison. Winnemac continued to attend the Indian Council and at one time boldly told the prophet that he lied. He must have been, had great influence to be daring enough to, to do this without being killed. By some it was reported that he was one of the Indian leaders at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Other Indians said he was not. Here again he probably was mistaken for the other Winnemac who was strongly against the Americans at this time. The next year both of them were present at the massacre at Fort Dearborn. The unfriendly Winnemac was one of the leaders. The friendly Winnemac brought a message from General Hall of Detroit to Captain Held and warned the captain not to trust the promises of the other Potawatomi chiefs. Winnemac signed the treaty at Fort Wayne in 1803 and 1809. After his death, his village on the Wabays was included in a tract of land given to Abraham Burnett, which was another fur trader. Saganosh, or Billy Caldwell, Saganosh, more familiarly known as Billy Caldwell, was the son of an Irish officer, Colonel Caldwell, in the British service. His mother was a Potawatomi, remarkable for her beauty and wisdom. He was born in Canada about 1780 and was well educated in the, in the Jesuit schools of Detroit. He fought with the British against the Americans and is said to have been with Tecumseh when he fell fight, fighting the Americans in the Battle of the Thames. He was in the neighborhood of Fort Dearborn when the massacre, massacre occurred, occurred there August 15, 1812. Caldwell was, was with Tecumseh and the British in the War of 1812. About 1820, he left the service of the British for, for service with the Americans at Chicago. He went to the Winnebago's in the Rebellion of 1827 and tried to dissuade them from attacking the Americans. He influenced his people not to join Black Hawk in his war. In the Treaty of Prairie du Chien, he received two and a half sections of land. In the Treaty of Chicago, September 26, 1853, he received $5,000 cash and annuities of $400 per year for life, while his children only received $600. He was honorable, high-minded, and generous. In early Chicago, he was a justice of the peace, a regular voter, and had property. In 1835, <laughs> he joined the Potawatomis in their march to their new home in Iowa. He died on the Potawatomi Reservation near Council Bluffs, September 28, 1841. Alexander Robinson whose Indian name was Chichi Bingwe, means blinking eyes, was the son of a Scottish trader and an Ottawa woman. He was born at Mackinac, Michigan in 1789. In 1825, he married a woman, three-fourths Indian. He was always more of a hunter and trader than a warrior. He spent much time in the Calumet region and for a time was in the employ of John Jacobs Astors. He signed the Treaty of Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin on July 29, 1829. In a treaty made at Chicago, September 26, 1833, he and Billy Caldwell received the $5,000 each and annuities for life, while each of their children received a small amount. Zachariah Seacott, and these are two of the trading places I'd like you to see on this map up here. We got about five minutes and then we'll be taking a break, okay? Uh, Zachariah Seacott, one of the many traders along the Wabash River, was a French Canadian by the name of Seacott. He married a Potawatomi squaw at what is now Independence near Attica, Indiana. And I went down two years ago and helped work on this, this site. It was very interesting. He and his Indian wife had five children. The oldest one's name was Zachariah. Zachariah was 12 years old when he was sent to the Catholic schools at Vincennes, where he remained three years. During this time, he made one or more trips to New Orleans. His father died when he was young, and the, as the oldest of the family, he had the responsibility of keeping his mother, helping his mother raise the family. He became skillful in all the ways and arts of the Indians of those days, and at the same time, he knew the white men also. He became a trader and also raised horses for sale. 
When Tecumseh came west seeking allies among the Potawatomis, Zechariah opposed him, saying he was nothing more than an agent for the British. He became friendly to Harrison, and because he trusted, became his trusted advisor. For all of this, his Indian friends became bitter towards him. He left independence and went back to Vincennes. So from here, he spent a year among the Indians of the South. He was a scout for General Harrison at Tippecanoe and during the War of 1812. He married Elizabeth, the daughter of a Potawatomi chief, Pereg. By her, he had three children. He increased his trade on the Wabash and became well-to-do. Because of his friendship for the Americans, the Potawatomis refused to elect him their chief, but instead gave this position of honor to his younger brother, George Seacott. And George Seacott is the one that had the trading post at Kokomo. As chief of the Potawatomi, George Seacott received three and one-half sections of land at the Treaty of Paradise Springs in 1826. Zachariah Seacott was a fine-looking man, more than six feet tall. He was tall and had keen black eyes. He was a shoe trader and became quite wealthy for his time. He died in 1850 and is buried be beside his wife in the old cemetery just north of Independence on the old Potawatomi Trail and near the great Potawatomi Springs. His importance and faithful service for the Americans have been overlooked by many Indian history writers. We just got a couple more and then, are you getting tired? Okay. Um, the first permanent settlement on the St. Joseph River in southwest Michigan was William Burnett, who came from New Jersey about 1776. He spent one year in fur trading and then went back to Mackinac to sell his fur. Here he got in trouble with the British agents who had him arrested and sent to Montreal. Later he returned to St. Joseph to find all of his property destroyed. He improved his position as an Indian trader by marrying Kakamiya, daughter of the Anaquaba and sister to the coming chief Topanibi. The marriage of Burnett and Kokiyama occurred about 1782 with the Catholic priest officiating with much pomp and ceremony. They built a good home about two miles from the mouth of St. Joseph. Here Burnett planted an orchard which outlived its planter. To the Burnett's were born seven children. These children were all sent to school in Detroit. Burnett himself was always friendly to the American cause. This caused him to get into trouble with the British and the sympathizers. He died about 1812 under circumstances not well known. Some think he might have been murdered by some of his opponents. Nancy's daughter was married to John Davies of the Wabash country. <laughs> Rebecca and married and lived in Detroit. <coughs> And in the U.S. treaties with the Potawatomis, the Burnett children received large grants of land. Little is known of any, of any of the sons except Abraham. He became a bitter enemy of the United States. It is said that he planned an ambush against General Harrison's army, which on its march to Tippecanoe, he took an active part in the battle. The creek that flows by the battleground was named after him, Burnett's Creek. At the Treaty of Paradise Springs in 1826, Abraham Burnett was given three sections of land. One of these sections included the old village of Chief Winnemac on the Wabash River, 11 miles down the river from Logansport. Here another creek was named after him, while Burnettsville, White County, Indiana, also bears his name. Is there still a town by the name of Burnettsville? Okay. You should know that you're White County, aren't you? Okay. This is uh, Joseph Bertrand was one of the early pioneers and one of the most noted citizens of Southwest Michigan. Little is known of his early life. One report is that he was born in Canada and another that Mackinac was his birthplace. It is said that he was close relative Henry Bertrand, friend and confidant of Napoleon Bonaparte. Young Bertrand, like many a young Frenchman, came into the western wilderness seeking his fortune. It is likely that he was first employed in the employment of William Burnett, who became his uncle by marriage. William Burnett <coughs> married Kakuima, sister to the main chief, Topanibi, and Joseph Bertrand married Madeline, daughter of Chief Topanibi. That settled the trade, didn't it, right there. He established a trading post on the west side of the St. Joseph River about 1880. This is on the Great Sock Trail and commanded much trade with the Indians. This site, of his, the site of his trading post is now covered with the St. Joseph River. Later he located on the bluff just opposite on the east side of the river. At the Treaty of Chicago, August 29, 1821, Madeline Bertrand, wife of Joseph Bertrand, was given one section of land at the Park of Ash. The 
Parkavash, this is the meaning of the place where it was, it's called, it means cattle pens. Uh, for an early day, the buffalo used to come there and graze on uh, the grass. They, they grew so fluently because the Indians had cleared off the grass. Uh, it was a place of great beauty. Here Bertrand built up a successful trading post with stations and in other places more or less distant. On the Great Sauk Trail came in, Indians came in large numbers and brought, brought their fur to trade for goods that Bertrand had for sale. The trail became the Detroit-Chicago Road and so became a trading center for the early pioneers. Bertrand became a great religious center as well for the Catholic missionaries as early as 1700 were there. When Joseph Bertrand located here, these early missionaries were revived. The early chapel was replaced in 1836 with a brick church, the first church house in southwest Michigan. Here the Catholic sisters started a school for girls. This later was moved across the line into Indiana and was the beginning of the famous St. Mary's College. In all of this, Joseph Bertrand took an active part. When he was located at the cow pastures, he built a house, but it is said that his Indian wife, Madeline, preferred to spend most of the time in a teepee in the backyard. To the Bertrands were born a number of children. At the Treaty of Chicago, when she received, received a section of land, each of her children received a half section at the Kankakee Portage near South Bend, Indiana. Okay, um, in 1826, two more of her children were given a half section. They are named at the treaty made at the Calvary Mi uh, Cary Mission, September 20, 1828. Madeline was given one section of land, and each of her children one half of sections. The Indian name of his wife was Mona. When she was baptized, she was Christian Madeline. When Bertrand when this was a real marriage and for life. She died in 1847 and her tombstone may be still be seen in the old churchyard on the north side of Bertrand. Just what become of Bertrand fortune is not known. It is like that he, likely that he had financial reverse. His children went west to the Potawatomi Reservation in Kansas. He followed in about 1858. He died in 1862 and is buried at the St. Mary's in Kansas. Okay, now I think we're going to take a break now. I think everybody's set long enough, okay? And when we come back, then we'll go into more local history. Just uh, wait a second. On the end of the uh, uh, refreshments table, I have some more copies of the handouts. We may not still have enough for everyone. <laughs> we had about 45 of them in total. So uh, the students, if the ones that are uh, have to have it for credit, pick them up as they go. And if there are any left, everyone else is can pick them up at will, but there are a few of them there. Thank you. You ready to go again? Yeah. Okay. This will go more into our local history around here, okay? We got the background, though, started, didn't we? In depth. Okay. At home in my library, I have a book. It's called Pioneer Hunters of the Kankakee by Lorenzo Warwick. Has ever, anyone heard of it? He was a trapper on the Kankakee River, and he wrote a book. But in that book was a piece of paper that he wrote of all these locations along the Kankakee River. Now I know where some of them are. I'm going to read them off to you because some of you men that hunt might know where they are too. Bissell Ridge, Indian Island, Fort Tassinong, Fort Bengal. After Tassinong was burnt, it was called Bengal by the English. Morgan Prairie East, Horse Prairie West of Crooked Creek, Coal Pit Island was one of the Hannons that was here. Do you know any of these places? You've heard of them? Where was Coal Pit Island? Do you know? It lies in a marshy area off to the northeast of that area. Okay. North Bend Flag Pond, Little Paradise Island, Long Ridge, Grape Island. Wasn't Grape Island close to Hebron mm -hmm. in that area? English Lake, we all know where that is. French Island, Butternut Ridge, Friars Island, Cornell's Upper Island. And, you know, if you go from Counts to Hebron on Route 8, there's a Cornell Cemetery that's sort of on the uplands, and that could be that area. Bucks Ridge, Shanty Island, Tea Garden, Beaver Lake, Bogus Island, Cornell's Bayou, Johnson's Island, Goose Island, Crooked Creek Claim, and Sandy Hook. So that was quite a stretch of the Kankakee, and that's what made our area so rich and famous. Okay. Out of uh, the pioneer hunters of the Kankakee, I've taken a couple excerpts. One from Lorenzo Warwick, the author, says, Oh, the hunting days of my youth have forever gone from me. 
I was born in a log cabin on my grandfather's farm near Valparaiso, Indiana in 1860 and within two miles and a half of the historical stream of which I am going to tell you. It was whilst watching the vanishing of a great hunting ground by the reclaiming of the Kankakee Swampland, or rather making a can new Kankakee River that involved the plot which forms the gist of my story. I have seen this, I have seen the sad faces of the old Potawatomi enemies, Indians who were driven from his hunting grounds on the Kankakee. And now we see a shadow of gloom of sadness on the faces of the few remaining old pioneer hunters like Bob Neasy and Jay Kreitzer who have spent their early years <laughs> in hunting, I'm trying to keep them awake back there, in hunting wild game and trapping the fur-bearing animals of the Kankakee. I hunted with the hunters from New York, from Philadelphia, Washington, Pittsburgh, and sportsmen from Europe. I have hunted as far north as I could and yet to be in the United States, and as far south as the Gulf of Mexico, and west as far as the Rockies, and I have yet found a place that equaled the Kankakee swamps for the variety of game to be found. In 1881, Warwick made a trip to the Potawatomi Reservations in Kansas. One old warrior told him of the tragedies of the Fort Dearborn Massacre. Another old warrior was a warrior of 17 summers when he was sent from Chief Winnem with Chief Winnemac down the Wabash to the Vincennes to counsel with General Harrison. Here is another Indian story. The day before General Harrison started on his march up the Wabash to meet the Prophet, two young men volunteered to join the army, Daniel Scott and Mike Haskins. They had a cousin, cousin in the army, an officer named Atwood, who was wounded at the Battle of Tippecanoe. Having a broken leg, he was picked up and carried away to the Kankakee Swamp, about 60 miles distance, and was cared for by a squaw. He was taking the place of her son, who was killed in the battle. <coughs> in 1821, Scott and Haskins came north to the Kankakee region to search for their lost relative, as there was a large estate to be settled back in Ohio. It was necessary to know his whereabouts. They brought with them trinkets, as the Indians usually wanted, such as pipes, tobacco, and knives, and needles, and so forth. They got in good with the natives by give them, giving them these goods. By kindness, they gained their friendship. Scott opened a store at Fort Tassinong, later called Bingo by the British. They never found their lost cousin. This was the first trading post in the region and was an ancient village when the French had established a trading post in long years past. It was on the old Potawatomi Trail from the Kankakee River to the Great Lakes. Okay, I brought you through. I got the French and the English here, and now we're pushing the Indians out, and I'm just going to go into a little bit about the Trail of Death, and then we'll go back to Fort Tassinong, okay? General Tipton was the man they helped get them organized in this area for the, uh, for the Trail of Tears. Um, Tipton writes, at the close of the first day he wrote, September 4th, 1838, we left Twin Lakes, Marshall County, Indiana. Early this morning, traveling today was attended with much stress on the account of scarcity of water. Provisions and forage were scarce and of poor quality. The distance traveled 21 miles. They spent this first night on the banks of the Tippy Canoe, three miles north of Rochester. For September the 5th, Tipton wrote, 51 persons were found unable to continue their journey on account of lack of transportation. Most of them were sick and someone, were le someone was left to care for them. On account of the difficulties of finding water, a distance of only nine miles a day was traveled. In the evening, a child died and was buried. This evening, they encamped at Mud Creek, south of Rochester. At almost every camp place, one or more of the Indians were left in nameless graves. Through Logan's Fort and down the Wabash, the sad procession continued. Not only was the physical suffering terrible, but the mental anguish was more so. To be driven from the homes of their ancestors and to be on the march hundreds of miles to a land they knew not where nor what was about all human strength could endure. Often these Christian Indians would be seen looking in vain, appealed to heaven as, Im as if imploring a higher power to help them in their stress. In 15 the days the march had reached Danville, Illinois. 
Here General Tipton left them and turned them over to the others to continue the, the journey westward. On across the Illinois by ways of Springfield and Jacksonville, across the Mississippi at Alton, across the Missouri at Independence and on to Kansas. They reached the Osage River in eastern Kansas after a march of 60 days. It was now winter time and without proper shelter or food, their terrible suf they suffered terribly. Mention should be made of the suffering of Father Pettit in behalf of these exiled Indians. He was the last priest that was with their mission uh, up there by Knox, Indiana. Okay. Though but a young man, yet in his 20s, he had been a sympathetic father to all the Indian children at his mission, and they were driven from their homes and the graves of their fathers. He was too weak to follow them into exile. But after the march began, so great was the suffering of the Indians that even General Tipton sent back to have Father P Pettit come and give them comfort. Though unable for the strenuous an, an undertaking, he hastened after them and arrived at their camp Sunday, September the 16th. He had left us a vivid description of the suffering of these Indians due to forced marches, dust, lack of water, sickness, and mental stress. He continued with them until they reached their new homes in Kansas. Here another priest took his place while he started to return <coughs> home to Indiana. He reached St. Louis but could go no farther. He was tenderly cared for by his Jesuit brothers. After four weeks of suffering, he passed away at the early age of 27, a martyr to the cause of bringing Christianity to the Potawatomi Indians of Indiana. Okay, okay now we're going to go back to Tassanong. Tassanong Palisade was a French mission and a trading post in a uh, Potawatomi Indian village. So about 30 years ago, we built a new house on this site. And the land has been in uh, the Anderson family since about 1837, 1838. In our front yard was a historical marker that said, Site of Tassanong, oldest village in northern Indiana, a French mission and trading post in 1673. The post office was established in 1837. And if you look at this map, the mail came from Detroit down to Tassanong, crossed, went down uh, the Bombs Bridge Road, which was the Indian Trail, and went to Lafayette. So look at the space from Detroit to Tassanong to Lafayette. John Jones was a postmaster and it was incorporated as a village in 1853. As we was out working in our garden and in the fields farming, we found a lot of artifacts out in the field and buttons and coins and Indian heads and all kinds of glass and everything. So of course I had to get Snoopy and get involved in this. And that's sort of how my research got started on this. Morgan Township was settled in 1833 by Jessic Isaac William uh, Morgan, and they come from Virginia and settled in Ohio. And they were part of the pioneers that came up through Door Village, or Laporte, Laporte means Door Village, to the old Northwest Territory. And most people think the southern part of Indiana was settled first because we had Wiatton on down there and you know the settlements were coming down the Ohio, that would be the en English influence and coming over the Appalachians. But we were part of the first uh, settlement because of the French influence coming from the north. Several priests labored in, area, in our area, Father Menard, Alouez, Chardon, and Diablon. The French flag flew over the area about 100 years, from 1661 to 1763. In 1763 was a Treaty of Paris, and the British took over and burned the French forts, and Fort Tassanong became Fort Bengal. So Porter County was under the Spanish flag for about two weeks, because the Spaniards uh, brought a garrison uh, up to about South Bend, Indiana, came through the area, and in 1917, over by Boone Grove, they dug up a bunch of Spanish muskets that was left as they were retreating back to wherever they came from. Uh, our town was laid out in a village. If it saw, uh, no copies are left up here, huh? <laughs> right. It was laid out as a village. We had three doctors there, three blacksmith shops, several general stores, and we had schoolhouses in several at three different times in different locations there. A general store and McGurdy's Tavern. McGurdy's ran the ferry at Bombs Bridge until they built the bridge. And then they moved up to Tassanong and they had uh, the McGurdy's Tavern there. And a lot of things happened there, like uh, that's where a lot of the Indians hung out and got their booze and all those kind of things. The post office, I told you, the mail route was from Detroit to Lafayette. And the end of Tassadon came when the surveyors came to put the railroads through. 
and they came to Tassanong for lodging and the lady's house that they stopped at she was making apple butter and she didn't want to be bothered with tourists. So they went on to Kautz and that's where the first railroad came through and then uh, and a few years later uh, they put a railroad through Malden. And so that was the demise of um, our little future city of Tassanong. And uh, some of the houses were b moved to Couts and are still standing. And in 1953, my father-in-law had the agriculture land converted back to ag land that had been into city lots because it helped him on property taxes, I'm sure. Okay. Um, here's our layout. Did some of you get copies of that? That's a layout of the town as it was incorporated in there. And we talked about three different schools at Tassanong. Uh, did everybody get a copy of those rules for the teachers? If not, I'd like to read it to you. These were the rules for the teachers. How many t school teachers are here? How many school teachers do we have? A few? Okay. Rules for a teacher in 1872. Teachers each day will fill lamps and clean the chimneys. Each teacher will bring a bucket of water and a scuttle of coal for the day's session. Make your pens carefully. You may whittle nibs to the individual taste of the pupil. Men teachers may take one evening each week for courting purposes or two evenings a week if they go to church regularly. After 10 hours in school, the teacher may spend the remaining time reading the Bible or other good books. Women teacher who marry or engage in unseemly conduct will be dismissed. Each teacher should lay aside for each pay, from each pay a goodly sum of his earnings for his benefits during his declining years so that he will not be a burden on society. <laughs> any teacher who smokes, uses liquor in any form, frequents pools or public halls, or gets shaved in a barbershop, will give good reason to suspect his worth, intention, integrity, and honesty. The teacher who performs his labor faithfully and without fault for five years will be given an increase of 25 cents per week in his pay, providing the Board of Education approves. <laughs> Can I take that to the teachers' union? <laughs> okay, I'll talk a little bit about the Indians. Uh, Bob and Phil told you about the prehistory when we first started these sessions. And um, I just want to explain to you, I, I do a lot of work in archaeology and I brought my friend with me, Altime Frobish, tonight and she is, has a degree in archaeology and she makes a really good friend, it, a fun one too. But anyway, uh, we, they talked about the four traditions of archaeology. There would be paleo, which is 1200, 12,000 to 6500 BC. Archaic, 8,000 B.C. to 1,000 B.C. The Woodland, 1,000 B.C. to about 1,500 A.D. And the Mississippian, 1,000 to about 1,500 A.D. Now I show you the four, four traditions because when we talk of the contact time Indians that were here with the French and the British and so forth, they came out of the early Mississippian traditions. They were the culture from there. And so those were your Potawatomis, your Miamis and so ever, what was on there. Okay, so we've come through about 300 years of tradition here. And if you'll notice in looking through here at my artifacts, we have um, artifacts from all these traditions, from Paleo clear down to the French contact time. So this makes this a very important site. And as we walk over it every year and farm it, more artifacts keeps working up. So it's really a fun hobby to be here. Okay. Um, I started my hobby in archaeology when I was five years old. My grandfather, John Shellhart, took me out looking for artifacts when I was five years old on a farm up by Parr, Indiana. Do you know where Parr, Indiana? No. Okay, way back then. So that's the German part of me. And the English part of me is like the, uh, the Shellharts were the first settlers, some of the first settlers of Winnemac. And the Kreichers and the Grooms, which are, was my grandmother, from Rensselaer here were some of the first settlers. And my mother was French and they settled the lands of Lebanon to Indianapolis. So I feel like I'm a real Hoosier. Uh, so I'd like to explain a few of my artifacts and then if you have any questions, I'd be try to answer those for you, okay? These are some of our trade pipes that we've had. You know, the Indians, or the Europeans come over here and the Indians taught them how to smoke and they went back and made all these trade pipes, okay, out of clay. And we have them for, like from France, from England, from uh, Ireland, and from Canada in Montreal. And if you look real close, you can see a lot of the names of the pipes on here. We have like bushels of these. 
that we've picked up over the years. Very rarely do you find a whole one in, intact. And some of the artifacts here, if you've noticed the trade beads, they come from Czechoslovakia and from uh, Italy. And the French brought them from uh, it the Italians and, and the Czechs and brought them over here and they were traded for the beaver pelts. And all the metal and the lockets, we have uh, French military buttons here. A lot of coins that dated like 1850s, about the time of the settlement. And if you know, Goodyear made buttons before he made tires. So we have several buttons in here that are, that are sort of like rubberized. So, and they're dated, 1850 Goodyear. Okay, this was a cache that we found as we were cleaning out some fence rows. We dynamited, and these came up after the next rain. The next spring, my son was plowing, and that was back when we used a moldboard plow. And in the furrow, he found a leather pouch, and as he pulled it out, it disintegrated. And in were these Mississippian points that he found in here. Okay, this, this is some Mississippian pottery, if you kind of like to look at this. And these artifacts are, go back to the paleo archaic time. So if there's no questions, thank you. No. Large grape, wasn't there a large grape island and a small grape island? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, are That's they right. here together? Or? That I don't know. Bob, do you know anything about? I didn't hear the question. Uh, there's a large grape island and a small grape island. Are they close to each other? They're south of Hebron, I know, but do you know that much about them? I've been on both of them. I, I really don't care. I know it was an average quite late. It probably depends on how the floodwaters were. <laughs> you know, it might have been all one island at one time, and the, you know, if the water went down, then they separated the two islands. I don't know, but if you talk to any of the historians around Hebron, I'm sure they can tell. Uh, have you read The Legend of Grape Island? No, I haven't. Oh, it's it. beautiful. Uh, probably get it at the library. The Legend of Grape Island? It's a story about a uh, girl and a boy from France. It's just a beautiful love story. Okay. Forget it. Okay. <laughs> I might need that. Up. That's how the grapes got there. Oh, okay. I knew there was a story behind how the grapes got there. Any other questions? Yes. <coughs> Personal question. Are you related to the Shellharts in the Demont Hebron area? Barbara Shellhart? Yes, that's my sister in law. <laughs> Mike, Michael Shellhart is my brother. Yes. I'll claim him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's been fun. Okay, the next time they ask me to do this, I guess I'll do it again, okay? <laughs> you, okay. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.